as I was talking to Chris Hoffman earlier, who's doing some work with research IT, uh, I asked him if he wanted to say anything and he said, no, we've got to keep this absolutely short because Larry's amazing and we really just want to hear from Larry. And so I'm going to keep this super short, but Larry is a physicist and an astronomer and a world leader in scientific computing. He's the founding director of the California Institute for Telecommunications and Information Technology. Uh, and he's also uh, at UC San Diego uh, in a partnership also with UC Irvine. And he's a professor there and doing work at UC San Diego's Jacobs School. A long time ago, he was the founding director of NCSA, uh, the uh, National Center for Supercomputing Applications, which at, I at UIUSC which always in my mind is just associated with Mosaic. Um, but most importantly for tonight, he's the principal investigator on the NSF specific research platform. Uh, Berkeley's a partner institution uh, and actually Camille Crittenden, I believe is one of the co-PIs on that. So she's joining us to, um, in the audience here tonight. Uh, and I'm not exactly sure what we're gonna hear about, whether it's Nautilus, which is a hypercluster for running containerized big data applications. But uh, Larry is a visionary, a futurist, and an amazing promoter of the things that should happen. So uh, Larry, I'm gonna turn it over to you and uh, you can go ahead and share your screen and we are here. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, this is gonna be um, uh, a lot faster than uh, I can go into details on each slide, but it's roughly 15 minutes um, and the slides will be available to everybody uh, afterwards. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is how academics have actually built uh, effectively a private cloud that is interconnected with all of the commercial clouds. And then I'll show examples of how we use it to solve problems that otherwise would be uh, impossible to solve. Um, so this all started with uh, ESNet in 2010, uh, coming up with this idea that on campuses, you needed to have a separate network called a science DMZ that would enable you to do high-speed uh, movement of data uh, and not just the normal commercial uh, internet uh, that we're all using. Um, and NSF adopted this and amazingly enough, then over the next uh, quite a few years has been uh, using calls for proposals uh, to uh, give about a half a million dollars to the, all these campuses to establish a science DMZ on their campus. Uh, and so it was obviously the next stage was to interconnect those. In other words, if you think about the DMZ, the way I like to think about it is like the freeway system, say in LA, uh, but the interstate highway system is what interconnects the freeway systems of the cities. And, and so that's what we uh, proposed uh, back in 2015. And as you can see, um, uh, Camille, who is on there uh, on the Zoom with us, uh, is uh, a co-PI and in fact, the leader of the science engagement team. And Phil Papadopoulos, who was at the San Diego Supercomputer Center, now is head of research computing at Irvine. Tom Defani, who uh, has been a long time, a 30 some odd year colleague of mine, and Frank Wertheim uh, at UCSD in physics uh, is, uh, these are the co-PIs. And uh, in the proposal, we, we showed how we were gonna be able to uh, not only link together all these campuses that are on the map using the scenic optical um, network uh, backplane that already connects them, but also we would be able to bring in supercomputers from LBNL, SDSC, from um, uh, NERSC uh, and, and um, NASA Ames and uh, NCAR. Uh, and uh, then this was driven by uh, over 50 different big data research projects that we had uh, write-ups of and over 32 uh, CIOs and other uh, campus uh, IT people. So it's a huge undertaking, really. Um, an example of, of unexpectedly how to do things came from Berkeley. Um, uh, they worked with Merced uh, and UCSD to establish these virtual realities uh, uh, exhibits that are interconnected uh, at uh, 10 gigabits a second to be able to move, to have common data sets, which can show up in all of them. And this was in the Citrus Tech Museum and then also later in other sites on Berkeley campus. Um, and, and again, it's that you need this large optical pipes to interconnect. Now, um, that was, uh, those kiosks are driven by uh, 
PCs, of course, which can handle uh, 10 gigabits. And so we made a generalization of these PCs, which are typically rack mounted, when we wanted to go to 40 or 100 gigabit uh, links. And uh, these are just rack mounted PCs, but they have uh, up to uh, 200 terabytes of rotating storage, uh, multi terabytes of solid state disk to be able to intermediate the flows coming through these very high speed pipes and the uh, disk, uh, which of course is a lot slower than the solid state disk. But in the back of these, you could have eight slots where you can actually then put GPU cards, gaming cards. And so these things become actually um, uh, machine learning, um, small desktop supercomputers. And they're being used very widely, as you'll see. In fact, we got a further grant that followed on, that built on the PRP to add 256 of these GPUs uh, on uh, 10 different campuses, uh, including Berkeley uh, and Merced and Santa Cruz, uh, that uh, would be for uh, helping people who are working on machine learning and AI algorithms. And then a third uh, NSF grant uh, we got uh, extends this across the United States using the Texas optical networks, the Great Plains network, and on through uh, to uh, New York and Pennsylvania and brings in two more supercomputers, the Texas Advanced Supercomputer uh, Center and the uh, and PSC. So um, this was uh, just uh, October of 18. The thing that was amazing is, of course, we had this all hooked together, but it was the cloud that completely changed everything. And that's because Google, which of course has a planetary computer, had to figure out how to run a billion searches a day and so forth. I couldn't have humans in a loop. So they adopted containers. Um, and then uh, in 2014, they made their entire Google global cloud uh, using uh, an open source uh, thing called Kubernetes software that they developed, um, which is now out of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Um, and then in, in 2016, they made that available. And in 2017, all the cloud providers uh, accepted that they would adopt the open source instead of rolling their own. And uh, by now, essentially two thirds or three quarters of the Fortune 500 have adopted Kubernetes as a container orchestration system. So effectively, our PRP began to act and feel just exactly from a software point of view like uh, commercial clouds. And in fact, for uh, doing the, the uh, managing the storage, we were able to use uh, Rook uh, uh, under Kubernetes, which was uh, 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 basically orchestrating a Ceph uh, cloud native uh, storage system that came out of UC Santa Cruz. Uh, so what we decided to do was to make a subset of PRP to and take all of the Fiona's, uh, all the endpoints that uh, could run Kubernetes and put those together into a single hypercluster, if you like, all running uh, Kubernetes. And that we call Nautilus. And what that does is it allows us to manage petabytes now of distributed data all across the, the rotating storage on these PCs, um, but interconnected at enormous speeds, about a thousand times the normal internet. Now, I don't want you to go into any detail. Again, this is just so you can uh, have these later for uh, slides. But if you look, these are the details of all those Fiona's from Merced, San Diego State, uh, UCSF, Stanford, all the way around that are part of Nautilus and are all interconnected with the uh, Scenic 100G network. Um, this has been extended now to, uh, first of all, the PRP is not just California, it goes up to the Pacific Northwest Gigapop in the Northwest states, over to Chicago, to their Imran uh, and Starlight, uh, uh, which is where a lot of uh, 100 gigs, it's probably more 100 gigs come into Starlight than uh, anywhere in the academic world. And then uh, uh, on top of that, uh, we've added in the other regional networks and internet too, which has massive data caches in New York and Chicago uh, and Kansas City. And all that's now interconnected by essentially the PRP. But it gets better. Um, 
the uh, Netherlands was a part University of Amsterdam in our original proposal. Since then, we've added in these other international partners, all interconnected at 10 uh, to 100 gigabits. And in fact, we were able to show that uh, we are able to get disk to disk transfers at uh, up to uh, five gigabits a second out of 10 gigabits a second from Korea and KISTI uh, to San Diego. Uh, that was impossible in the old days, just using layer three internet for long distance high bandwidth uh, because TCP IP would back off and you'd lose the bandwidth. Uh, but with the PRP, it's uh, no problem. And so we have a lot of global collaborations now. And in fact, you can see the scale of this. We have over 6,000 CPU cores now, uh, nearly 600 GPUs, uh, and we have uh, uh, petabytes of uh, storage. Uh, so what does it let you do? Well, for instance, um, uh, Scott Sellers uh, was, uh, got his PhD at Irvine uh, at the Center for Hydrometeorology and Remote Sensing. Then he did a postdoc at Scripps Institution of Oceanography in their Center for uh, Water in the West. And we are, he is able to download a NASA uh, a satellite imagery, do machine learning on them, and then transfer those uh, down from uh, to Irvine and then to San Diego. And it went from taking 19 days to do a single workflow without the PRP to now 52 minutes, which is over 500 times faster. And of course that changes the science totally. Um, uh, then uh, part of the PRP of course is to get more people as we got examples of how it worked, uh, to get more people involved in Berkeley and Camille and Chris and, and, and Others, uh, Jeff particularly weekly, uh, have been involved in the science engagement. So this is a workshop, for instance, in 2018 that was held at Santa Cruz, uh, organized by uh, the PRP uh, science engagement team at Berkeley and co-sponsored by Merced and Santa Cruz and, and Citrus. And of course, you know, this is one of the few projects in which two of the Gray Davis Institutes, Citrus and Cal IT2, are actually uh, co-PIs uh, on a project of this scale. It's probably the only one actually uh, between the four institutes. Well, let me just give you an example of what we didn't expect to show up. Ice Cube. This is the South Pole Neutrino Observatory that NSF runs. And one of the, the ways that you figure out where the neutrino, which are, you know, they'll go through like 18 light years of lead without scattering once. So they're like ghost particles. But occasionally they scatter and they send off this, this cascade of photons and there are all these under ice scintillation cameras that see them, counters. And so that turns out that this uh, is a great for using GPUs. They were using CPUs on the open science grid, which is another basically a, a kind of a cloud, uh, but they didn't have GPUs, which are a hundred times more effective than CPUs for this uh, because of the parallel nature of the photon transport. What you're seeing here is the number of GPUs vertically, which goes up to 400, that are used by the different namespaces. Each application has a namespace and is completely secure from the others. And the blue is, is how in March of 19, a year ago, IceCube came out of nowhere like a horde of locusts and basically ate uh, almost all of our uh, GPUs, which is fine because they weren't being used at the moment by other things. So that was a totally unexpected uh, thing. It drove the use of GPUs up 4x uh, in one year uh, on the PRP. But then it got better. That wasn't enough. So for those of you who have not tried to um, whet the appetite of an NSF billion dollar um, observatory, let me tell you, these folks have no limits to their appetite. And so they said, well, it was great. Uh, we ate uh, all your GPUs, three or 400 of them, but we actually would like tens of thousands of GPUs. And so we decided now, since we're using uh, Condor, which is a way to do high throughput computing, we could extend off of the PRP into all three of the commercial clouds and we could grab all their GPUs for a single problem. And this, as far as I know, has not been done by academics before. <clears throat> and so we went out to AWS, Azure, and, and Google Cloud, 
collected uh, about 50, over 50,000 of their GPUs over eight generations. We don't care whether they're 32-bit, 64-bit. We don't care are they old or they new. We can use them just fine. And what you can see here is uh, uh, over uh, 51,000 GPUs used for mm, two hours, something like that, effectively a third of an exaplop uh, uh, hour. So um, this was uh, just an example of how once you have interoperability oper between something like the PRP and uh, the commercial clouds, you can do things that really hasn't been done before. Uh, one of the things that Camille and her team has helped with, of course, is, is part of the outreach is uh, getting us a really nice website. And so for those of you who want to dig in and, and find more, this was redesigned as part of what uh, uh, Berkeley helped uh, with UCSD on uh, recently. So I'm going to just stop here. Um, I think I'm 30 seconds short of 15 minutes uh, and uh, take some questions. Hi, this is Jason at, at Berkeley and, and Research IT there. Um, that's a tremendous talk. I'm just curious, I can't help but wonder what are some things in the pipeline uh, for, this, for this project, it's tremendous. Well, we are very fortunate in that um, our program officer at NSF uh, has just uh, approved, uh, not I guess officially officially, but by email, uh, that they're going to fund an extension of one more year past the five years that it was approved for originally. Uh, that's really important because, of course, the other two proposals uh, are extending beyond that five years. So there's a lot of interest. You know, if you think about the, um, the Great Plains Network, uh, that's all the states basically north of Texas and south of North Dakota. And there's so many universities there that we could be involved. Another thing, just to give you an example, many of them, for instance, use uh, San Diego Supercomputer Center or the text, you know, TAC or something. Well, you know, these days, supercomputers are so fast that you will generate a massive amount of data that's just sitting there at the supercomputer. If the supercomputer is lightly uh, used enough that they can now let you do your science analysis of that data on their computer, well, that's fine. But in fact, they have to turn down uh, 50 to 30, two thirds of the projects that want to be on the computer. So they don't have extra time. But in the case uh, that uh, Shaw was at uh, Santa Cruz, we had a, um, an example where he was using NERSC. Uh, he was helping the astronomers there. They had a thousand node uh, cluster on the campus. Um, well, but they didn't have the kind of bandwidth that this did. They now are up to something like 100 gigabits. They can download three-dimensional supernovas or large astronomy surveys to their cluster and then do highly interactive um, science analysis. Well, I think there are so many examples of that latently sitting out there, uh, but nobody thinks, seems to think it's their job to find the end users and the supercomputers and knit them together and uh, with people like Chris and, 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 and Shaw, I think at NERSC, for instance, we, we, we can, helping, you know, um, our colleagues there, uh, I think there's a lot of examples out of NERSC that we could do, the same out of SDSC, the same out of TAC, and so forth. So I think we're, that's one of the areas, one of the use cases. So I guess another way of saying it is we're looking at the individual users and to figure out by abstraction, what is the use case? And then saying, well, what other folks out there have the same use case, maybe even a similar workflow, but haven't realized that they could supercharge it by a factor of 10 or 100. Um, so, so, and that's again what uh, Berkeley, uh, with Camille uh, there uh, leading the science engagement, that's one of the things that science engagement is about, is trying to find the end users and then help them understand how they can take advantage. Larry, uh, first of all, good to see you again. Uh, secondly, I, so I have a- I have, What are you doing here? Well, uh, I, this is continuing uh, adult education. 
Um, well, <laughs> you know, now, well, that's the job of my CTO, you know, and, and students. the job of the CTO students is to educate the professors. And as you know, they always fail. Uh, but uh, I have, so I have, a, I have two questions. I have a question and a suggestion. Sure. Uh, and so actually, I'll go with the suggestion first. I don't know if you've talked to the people at the nanograph experiment. Uh, I can provide you contact details later. Sure. Uh, this is an extremely interesting project uh, to me because these are people who look at um, do timing analyses of millisecond pulsars looking for very low frequency gra nanohertz, in fact, gravitational waves. Sure. And they're convinced that there is that there is gravitational wave data in this in these timing analyses. I talked to them. I've talked to them several times over the years, and they and they tell me that they have a huge problem of getting data from the repos at uh, West Virginia. Right? Yeah. This is ought to sound familiar. Uh, and it seems to me that that this would be a perfect candidate for the global research platform. Well, it it, it depends on whether the repository is um, reachable by these high-speed optical networks or not. Um, Cornell and West Virginia. Yeah, so it turns out that sometimes a place like West Virginia are, are, are a little uh, less uh, endowed with this sort of thing. But I'll tell you, I got an example in South Dakota where South Dakota is part of the Great Plains Network. And that's where in Sioux Falls it is a repository for the Landsat imagery. Uh, and all of a sudden, we're finding that there are lots of folks in the UC system, for instance, that need Landsat data. But, you know, the new high resolution Landsat is going to be much larger data sets. And they're going to need much larger things. So we're going to be, I'm hoping in this next year, coming year, uh, we'll be able to hook them up. So if you want, uh, let me, uh, put me in contact and we'll see what uh, it takes to get them hooked up. Yeah, I will. And now I actually have a question. Which okay. is, is there, are there uh, is there a use case uh, for, for um, last mile basically to, to have a, a to have lightweight compute right next to relatively small data sets or a single desktop user? Um, I'm think, thinking of, of relatively low data rate or low bandwidth sensors, but that are inaccessible or, or hard to reach places. In other words, is there a place that you'd like to get to that the optical networks can't reach? I, sorry to uh, to jump in. This is Jason at Berkeley. Um, in the interest of time and for the other speakers, I, I just need to ask that let's punt on that question for the moment. And then if we have time, we'll come back around to it. Um, or you guys can can take it offline and chat. Yeah, but, we uh, have actually uh, the High Performance Wireless Research and Education Network is all the servers are on the PRP. Yeah. Uh, and they are all the data is coming in from the sensors over wireless networks. OK, thank you. I had a real quick question that came in uh, about uh, the sustainability of the effort. And when you had the one year extension, what are your thoughts beyond that? And what are ways that universities or other uh, measures could be taken to help make it more sustainable ongoing? Right, well, it's, it's, uh, I'm not, it's not my job to do anything past the end of the sixth year. It is my job during the 18 months left to find folks who will carry out similar activities, but the PRP will vanish at the end of an NSF grant. That's just the way NSF does things. So the two sustainable folks are the CIOs and the people on the head of research computing on campuses, which uh, uh, I think are going to have more and more demand for this kind of thing. It's not unusual to be able to have uh, 10, 40, 80, even 100 gigabit links uh, across campus. They've got a lot of optical fiber. It's just not necessarily set up this way. And the other is places, the regional optical networks themselves, such as uh, uh, the Great Plains Network or Learn in Texas, or for that matter, Internet2. And Internet2 is a partner with us. So I think these are services that you could imagine of something like Internet2 uh, uh, offering, uh, uh, as well as the regional optical networks, because after all, every year they have to explain to their campuses why they should keep paying the money <laughs> to internet to or regional optical networks, including scenic. Um, and so this would be a new capability, which is all possible within their existing optical network. Nobody has to lay any new fiber or anything. Thank you. The CIOs in the audience, thank you. <laughs> Well, without them, this wouldn't have happened. <laughs>